we're not in a cold war yet. Uh, people have been uh, foreseeing, foreshadowing, fearing this for some years. Um, on the bright side, the US and the old Soviet Union had very few economic dealings. They were almost in hermetically sealed opposite empires. Uh, today, the US-China trade relationship is still thriving. It's still the world's biggest uh, two-way trade. There's still some, it's subdued, but there's still some foreign investment occurring in both directions between China and the US. Um, so it's, there's still a long way. And, and people you know, uh, can still move. Of course, there are COVID constraints, but people can still move relatively easily between the two countries. And none of that was possible in the actual Cold War, the Soviet Union and the Americans. So we're a long way from that. However, all the, t all the tendencies and trends are heading in that direction of a bifurcation of the world into two spheres. Um, and what we saw most recently, well, this year, for example, and Australia has been part of both of these, there have been two new uh, diplomatic or political uh, groupings in the world. The first was the Quad, which had its first summit in March. It was uh, by video link, but it was still the first meeting of the Quad, and that brings together the US with Japan, India, and Australia. And the Quad leaders are about to have their second uh, summit. This is going to be face-to-face -face in Washington this week, and that's one of the reasons Scott Morrison's there now. And the other uh, big uh, change was the new AUKUS arrangement, Australia, UK, US, that we saw announced last week. Now, the submarines got all the headlines. The submarines, uh, in my view, are about totemism. They're not actually delivering any capability. So let's put the submarines out of our minds for a second. It's essentially a signal that the US, Britain and Australia are going to merge their military industrial complexes, the research and production, uh, and try to create supply lines that operate independently of China. And this is, this is a trend we are seeing increasingly uh, with countries in the US sphere uh, moving to, to set up supply lines that aren't, aren't uh, dependent on China, because partly because they've become so dependent and partly because China has uh, displayed with Australia and others that it's not a reliable partner and that it does make political uh, interventions. Um, and on the other side, uh, China is, it has in itself uh, stepped up uh, its own internal um, self-reliant supply line processes. So the world is, and of course China through Belt and Road, has been trying to stitch together its own uh, system of alliances. So that the world is heading slowly, not inexorably, but it is heading in that direction. And who needs to make the first move in a sense? We've, Biden is making it very clear that this region is his priority. AUKUS is just one example of it, the Quad, as you point out, that China's aggression is his priority and China's becoming increasingly autocratic. So are they going to even heed these warnings? I don't think so, no. Um, as you say, they're each set on their own projects. Uh, the the uh, Chinese system under Xi Jinping has changed. Um, it was essentially a status quo country, but under Xi it's become a revisionist power. That is a country that wants to change the world as it currently exists, um, enlarging China's territorial boundaries, seizing maritime territories also claimed by its neighbours, um, and with border frictions elsewhere, Japan, India not notably. Um, it's also trying to uh, redesign international institutions and structures. It's trying to assert more power and it's, uh, exert its own will in the world through those means and enlarging itself. Um, the US is now leading uh, not a revisionist uh, but a status quo movement, uh, a movement that, of course, the Australia is part of, trying to restrain that revisionism by China and trying to keep the world as it currently is uh, to keep as much stability um, as, as they can. Now, you're going to have to persuade either Joe Biden to abandon that effort or Xi Jinping to abandon his effort for a revisionist China. But unless one of those great powers changes their minds, uh, those, that trend is set and whatever Guterres, the UN Secretary General says, is uh, essentially just background noise. Yeah. Uh, Peter, this Evergrande property group that is teetering on the brink of collapse is a really interesting point and, and juxtaposition of this whole issue where it's getting hard for businesses in China. But this is a real test for China, isn't it, to, to, to whether or not they are going to let proper markets fall where they will. What is, what is the, the feeling about this as a test for China and what they might do? 
Well, on the one hand, uh, for several years now, Xi Jinping's government has been trying to uh, put an end to uh, this huge speculative property bubble. Xi Jinping says uh, housing is for living in, not for speculation. Uh, I think most Australians would be able to identify with that sentiment. Um, we only wish it were true. But um, uh, so as part of that, the Chinese government regulators have applied a whole bunch of restraints on the banking and financial sector lending to real estate and property, as well as under the property development sector. Uh, and what we now see is the effect of all those coming to bear on the most indebted part of the Chinese property development sector, which is the company you mentioned, Evergrande. Now, the dilemma is this. Uh, the Chinese government, um, which has independently started waging a campaign essentially against private capital and private markets called the Common Prosperity Campaign, which emphasises not growth any longer, which was has been the emphasis of Chinese leaders since Deng Xiaoping in 1978 when he opened the market in China, uh, now switching from growth to redistribution. And while that's going on under the, the, this rubric of common prosperity, this Evergrande problem presents. Now, the, the question, the dilemma for Chinese policymakers is this. They have said that they will allow market forces to operate. This thing, Evergrande, this company is quite large. Uh, it's the most indebted property developer in the world will allow it to collapse under the weight of its own indebtedness. And the way the markets are trading its shares and uh, bonds and other obligations, the market's already decided this is essentially, it's a close to worthless company. So the markets have written it off. However, if that goes ahead and is allowed to collapse in an unruly way, it looks like it will bring down a bunch of other, also similarly indebted property developers in, in China. Now, if you, have a, if you have that happen and there's a, a number of large property developers crashing, that means that the unsold inventory of apartments and other real estate, real estate that they hold will be on the market at fire sale prices. Uh, now, Mr. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Lee don't want to see a collapse in the value of their homes. And if that starts to become a widespread phenomenon, then that's a potential big political problem and one of social and political unrest. So this is, this is where Xi Jinping has to try and guide the outcome. And the, the markets are on knife edge now. Uh, the first big uh, interest payment that Evergrande is due to make is on Thursday this week. And so we're, we're rapidly approaching uh, the denouement for this drama. Good to talk, Pete. Thanks so much. Pleasure, Beth.